Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Jane Clark. Jane is a founding partner of Clark and Gottsler, Attorneys at Law. She has 20 years of human resources, labor, payroll and benefits experience as a law firm attorney, director of HR at a multi-state multi-site Wisconsin company, and as Chief Operating Officer at QTI Human Resources, a statewide comprehensive HR company. At the latter, she directed the Human Resources, Payroll, and Benefits practice with for-profit and not-for-profit clients located all over the country. With their real workplace experience and the focused mission and structure of the firm, Clark & Gottsler delivers large, large law firm quality and expertise with small firm focus at affordable rates. Unlike most law firms, their attorneys also have decades of in-house experience, so they understand the practical realities of applying legal advice. Clark & Gottsler clients range from large multi-state employers to startup businesses and represent all major industries in the nonprofit sector. Clark & Gottsler's mission is to provide sound, practical advice and options while maintaining the highest standards of communication and responsiveness. Today, Jane will discuss the DOL's final overtime rule and the impact on the staffing industry. The U.S. Department of Labor has announced changes to the Fair Labor Standard Act employment regulations that will extend overtime protections to nearly 5 million white-collar workers previously classified as exempt from overtime pay. In today's Industry Insider webinar, Jane will provide an up-to-date review of the changes and how this could impact your firm and the staffing industry. By the end of the session, you'll know the details of the changes to the Fair Labor Standards Act and how to prepare your firm for the impending change. Please join me in welcoming Jane. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone today. I am sure you are just listening with bated breath to all of the overtime final rule changes that were announced yesterday. So without further ado, here we go. Amanda, I'm having trouble changing the slides. Okay, do you want me to do that then? Yes, I don't know why. Okay, if you could just click ahead, please. Sure. Are you seeing the agenda okay. slide now? Yes, thank you. Okay. We will start with a review of why wage and hour compliance is important, review the current or the previously current state of federal, state, and um, local wage and hour laws. We'll review the course that has been taken starting with President Obama's um, directive in March of 2014, the notice of propo proposed rulemaking from last summer, and then the regulatory implementation of the final rule, the provisions of the final rule, and then go into discussions of practical ne next steps for employers as well as employee communication and messaging. As you can see from this slide, there has been a 453% increase in wage and hour cases over the last 15 years. If you look, especially since 2004, there has been a marked increase in wage and hour claims. You see that peak starting in 2004 
because that is the last time the wage and hour regulations have been updated, which is another reason why these changes in 2016 are so important. We anticipate that as after 2004, we will see a large uptick in wage and hour claims, not only from plaintiff's attorneys, but also from the Department of Labor itself. In fact, the Department of Labor has had, by its own naming, a misclassification initiative. They are looking at the classification of employees, not only in the category of exempt or non-exempt, but also in terms of independent contractors. In fiscal year 2015, their claims, their, the investigations that they have brought forth resulted in $74 million in back wages for more than 102,000 workers. And now those are claims that not only employees have brought, but also that the Department of Labor initiated through audits. You are also seeing much, many more high profile cases, lawsuits like those brought against Uber on the issue of on-demand employers for employers who improperly classify employees as independent workers, as independent contractors, as opposed to employees. So starting in July of last year, we saw an administrator's interpretation drafted by Dr. David Weil, who is really at the forefront of the Department of Labor's activism on wage and hour issues. In that, he called sharp attention to the issue of misclassification of independent contractors and referred to that and, and said at that time, most workers are considered employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act broad definitions. That tells you the Department of Labor's rationale and philosophy on this issue. And I think also explains a lot of the proposed changes to the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations that we'll be reviewing over the next hour. Then in July of 2015, the Department of Labor issued a notice of proposed rulemaking where they set forth in great detail proposed revi revisions to the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations. In September of last year, that was the deadline for the public to submit comments to the proposed changes. Then in August of last year, the National Labor Relations Board, while not under the Department of Labor, issued the Browning-Ferris decision, which vastly expanded the definition of joint, joint employer liability under the National Labor Relations Act. And the methodology outlined in there is really consistent with the Obama administration's aggressive enforcement philosophy. So what we'll do right now is a recap of the previously current Fair Labor Standards Act exemptions, just to give everybody a little history lesson. In order for a position to be considered exempt from the overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act and to be called exempt, they must meet all three of the following tests. One, the salary basis test, which means that the employee or the worker is paid on a salaried or predetermined basis. They're paid the same amount every pay period. Two, the salary level test, which is that the employee must be paid at least a minimum weekly amount. We'll go over the details of each of these on subsequent slides. And then also must satisfy the duties test, which means that their actual job duties must meet the prescribed test given the nature of the job they do. That basically requires that the level and responsibility associated with the job duties rise to the level of being exempt from the overtime provisions. First of all, here are the salary basis test. With this, as I said before, the employee must be paid a predetermined and fixed salary that is not subject to reduction because of variations 
in either the quality or the quantity of the work. So as with hourly employees, they are paid on a, as opposed to hourly employees who are paid on a variable basis, depending on how many exact hours they work per day, a salaried employee is paid the same amount every week. So with this too, exempt employees must be paid for any work week in which the employee performs any work with the exception of deductions that you make and pay in accordance with bona fide plans or pol policies, such as earned time off, unpaid suspensions, infractions of the safety or conduct rules, issues of that nature, offsetting jury witness fees, or if it's in their first la or last week of work where they aren't working a complete week. The next test is the salary level test. With this, the amount of salary paid to the employee has to meet at least a minimum threshold. Previously, that threshold was $455 a week or $23,660 per year. The DOL previously recognized the salary level test as the best single test of exempt status, basically meaning this is forcing employers to put their money where their mouth is. If they truly think the employee's position is worthy of being exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, they have to be paid at least a significant dollar amount. You're going to see with both the proposed changes and the final rule, they're really raising this bar, really forcing employers to put their money where their mouth is on this. The third test is the duties test, and that is really where employees' job duties must primarily involve either executive, administrative, or professional, this is known as the EAP, the first initial of each of those words, duties as defined by the regulations. Those are lengthy tests and I encourage you to look at those. There also have over the years um, been an expansion to include computer professionals, certain computer professionals, outside sales employees, and commissioned retail sales employees. There is also a highly compensated employee exemption, which has a reduced relaxed duties test if the employee's total annual compensation is at or above $100,000. With this, the relaxed duties test means that you only need to customarily and regularly perform one of the duties of an exempt executive, administrative, or professional employee. The rationale behind this is that the fact the employee's compensation is at or above this higher threshold is considered an indicator that the employee's duties most likely are, are of a professional nature. So some of the feedback that the Obama administration and many employee rights activists um, have provided over recent years is a concern that the FLSA intended overtime protections are not fully implemented, quote unquote. This means that they think that the way positions and pay and the nature of the jobs employees are doing are not necessarily covered under the regulations and the Fair Labor Standards Act itself. They certainly think that salary levels are out of date and don't properly screen out white collar employees when paired with a salary basis test. In fact, since the Fair Labor Standards Act was implemented in 1938, it has been updated only seven times and it was last updated in 2004. In fact, the Department of Labor has noted many times that the current salary level threshold of $23,660 is actually below the poverty level for a family of four. They also have said many times that they do not think that the duties tests reflect current jobs and duties and are actually very difficult for employers in their HR departments and the employment lawyers who advise them are difficult to apply uniformly. So let's discuss now the presidential directive that President Obama issued 
and how that has informed the Department of Labor's actions over the past year. So in March of 2014, President Obama issued a directive to the Secretary of Labor and the Department of Labor to update the Fair Labor Standards Act regulations regarding the exempt status test. The goal at that time was presented, uh, was presented to provide longstanding economic security for covered employees and to clarify the regulations. Here's a direct quote from the directive, that the regulations regarding white collar exemptions have not kept up with our modern economy. Because these regulations are outdated, millions of Americans lack the protections of overtime and even the right to the minimum wage. He directed the Department of Labor and the Secretary of Labor to modernize and streamline the regulations to update the existing protections, to address the changing nature of the workplace, and to simplify the regulations to make them easier to understand and apply. And you'll see as we go through the proposed rules, as well as the final, where the Department of Labor really strived to meet, strove to meet these directives. So now, let's go through a quick summary of the proposed rules and make our way to the final rules. We just talked about the stated goals. We can move beyond this slide. Now, um, one of the directives was to update the salary level threshold. As we discussed, the previous threshold was 23,660. The proposed rules proposed a new salary level threshold of 50,440 per year and proposed doing an annual auto update indexing of this to the 40th percentile of weekly earnings for all salaried workers nationwide. The intent of this was to ensure that the amounts remain meaningful, effective, and relevant. At the same time, the DOL also sought comments on whether or not to count non-discretionary bonuses toward that salary threshold. The notice, the NPRM also proposed changes to the highly compensated employees threshold. They proposed an increase from $100,000 per year to $122,148 per year and proposed indexing and auto updating based on the 90th percentile of weekly earnings for all full-time salaried workers nationwide. A third area that they asked for public comment on was to the duties test. They asked for comments on the current duties test. We weren't sure after that what the Department of Labor would do in the final rule, and fortunately they answered that for us. So in response to those proposed changes, the public was very vocal. The Department of Labor received 293,370 comments by the deadline. This was a marked increase from the proposed changes in 2004 when there were only 75,280 comments. Employers and employer groups voiced loud opposition to these rules. There were especially um, high opposition to the rules from the nonprofit sector and the retail, restaurant, and hospitality industry. There was tremendous concern about the financial impact of the rules, as well as what the timing of these changes would be and the onboarding to implementation. Fortunately for all of us, um, the Department of Labor seemed to listen, but they didn't shut it down. So let's talk about the implementation of the final rule. So as a, in March, the Department of Labor submitted the final rule to the White House Office of Management and Budget. In May of 2016, um, the OMB 
had by that time the OMB had held 15 plus meetings, including one on May 10th. At that point, we thought the review would last about 50 to 60 days. Um, and we thought that the final rule would come out either on May 13th or May 16th based on what the congressional calendar was at that time. In the end, the Department of Labor released the proposed changes via email on the evening of May 17th with the final rule released officially in the Federal Register um, on May 19th. So let's talk about the effective dates for the overtime rule. The effective dates for changes to the standard salary level threshold and the highly compensated employee salary level threshold will be December 1st, 2016. That is 196 days um, to implementation. Starting on January 1st, 2020, the auto updates will take effect. You'll note that that is a four-year gap for that, um, and from then on, the auto updates will take place every three years. We'll um, talk about that a little further on in the slides. So how practically will that happen? The Department of Labor will publish the updated rates in the Federal Register and on the Wage and Hour Division website at least 150 days before the effective date. This is, this, um, marks a big change from 2004 when the Department of Labor gave employers 120 days to prepare for implementation of changes. So as I had mentioned before, we thought many employment lawyers thought that the final rule would come out on either March 13th or March 16th based on the congressional calendar. And that was because under the Congressional Review Act, any final rules that are promulgated by a federal agency within the last 60 legislative days of a president's term can be subject to congressional disapproval or invalidation. And the purpose behind this is to prevent an outgoing president from taking extreme regulatory action in the final days of his or her term. So um, based on that, um, everybody thought the rule would come out May 13th or 16th, but it turned out additional legislative days were added to the calendar. So the deadline now is actually March 23rd. So this rule being published in the Federal Register on May 19th gave a four day buffer. But I think that should tell all of us we should expect to see some more rules promulgated over the next four days. And in fact, I thought this was an interesting statistic. Since January, uh, January 1st of 2016, there have been 195 regulations issued by this administration. And that allows them to bypass um, congressional review under the Congressional Review Act. A little bit of gamesmanship on both sides of the aisle. So let's talk about what these final rules are. The standard salary level threshold in the overtime final rule did, was not increased as much as we had previously thought from the proposed um, notice of proposed rulemaking. It's actually $47,476 per year or $913 per week. So employees must be paid at least that much to be considered overtime. Next, under the salary level threshold indexing, so this is that auto updating that was first bandied about with the NPRM. They set the index, they, they changed the index. Instead of being based on the 40th percentile of full-time salaried workers nationwide, they based it based on the lowest wage census region. That is currently the South. Traditionally, that's been either the Midwest or the South. 
And using that as a basis has strong historical precedence in previous rulemaking. So why did they deviate from that um, index proposed in the NPRM? It was because much of the feedback given by the public uh, indicated that that rule did not account for lower salaries in certain regions, so would have had um, it would have been unduly burdensome in those geographic regions. So then the final rules um, standard salary level threshold, um, I'm sorry, could you go back a slide? We... Nope, we talked about that. I'm sorry, flip forward. Okay. So it is thought that these indexing on the standard salary level will lead to a 7.7% increase over the course of three years. By 2020, which is the next time we will have the auto update, it's estimated that the standard salary level threshold will be 51,168. By 2023, it's estimated it would be about $55,108 per year, and by 2026, it would reach $59,351 per year. Then, on the highly compensated employee salary level threshold, you'll note here that unlike with the standard salary level threshold, the Department of Labor actually increased from the annual pay that was noted in the proposed changes. So the proposed change was the proposed salary level was 122,000 and it increased in the final rule to $134,044 per year. Note that this stayed with the index that was in the proposed changes which is indexing it based on the 90th percentile of full-time full -time salaried workers nationally. Please flip ahead. So what are going to be, what is the timing of these salary changes? Any upward changes must be in effect before December 1st, 2016 to ensure preservation of exempt status. So any pay adjustments must cover pay periods that include December 1st. So your pay periods in December this year that cover that time period must reflect the salary changes if you are going to be increasing employees' salaries to stay at or above this threshold. So now let's talk about the frequency of these auto updates. As I said before, it's now going to be every three years, starting in January 2020. And they deviated from the annual auto update that was in the proposed changes because the Department of Labor um, responded to commenters' concerns that the annual auto updates would be too burdensome for employers. So as I mentioned before, the auto updates will take effect every th three years, starting in January 2020, then again in 2023, and 2026. The DOL will publish all of these updates in the Federal Register at least 150 days or approximately five months before that effective date. And that will be based on second quarter 2019 data. So that will be the pattern they follow going forward. Then, as I indicated before, in the proposed rules, the Department of Labor asked for comments about whether non-discretionary bonuses should be able to be incorporated to satisfy the standard salary level. And fortunately, the Department of Labor did in the final rule concede that employers are able to use non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments, including commissions, to satisfy up to 10% of the salaried level. So up to 10% of that 
47476 And included in that non-discretionary bonuses can be bonuses tied to productivity and profitability, but the bonuses must be paid at least on a quarterly basis. It can be paid more frequently, and it can include an employer catch-up payment to attain that level. And even if you as an employer pay very large bonuses, say, you know, two times an employee's salary or three times in bonuses, the amount that can be attributable to the standard salary level is capped at 10%. For highly compensated employees, highly comped employees must receive at least the standard salary level, 47,476, divide, divided by the number of pay periods per year, each pay period. So you would, if you have um, semi-monthly payroll, divide that by 24, and that is the amount that the employee must receive at least in salary level each pay period. You cannot use non-discretionary bonuses to meet the standard salary level for highly compensated employees. However, the differential between that standard salary level and the $134,044 can be satisfied with non-discretionary bonuses, incentive payments, commissions, and other forms of non-discretionary deferred compensation. Fortunately for all of us, the final rule did not include any changes to any of the duties tests. The Department of Labor um, indicated that they believe the new standard salary level and the auto updates will work most effectively to distinguish between overtime eligible workers and exempt workers. The Department of Labor, in fact, said with the salary level increase, quote, the number of workers for whom employers must conduct the duties test to determine exempt status is reduced, thus simplifying the exemption. So according to the Department of Labor, the estimated economic impact of the final rule is to extend overtime protection, which means overtime pay, to an additional 4.2 million employees, and that it raises wages by $12 billion over the next 10 years. Note there are no exemptions under the final rule for nonprofits, colleges, universities, or public entities. There were also no exemptions for part part-time employees. So that standard salary level that we have been talking about, that 47,476 applies even to part-time workers. It's not that if somebody works 50% time and you think their duties would otherwise make them exempt, you can't pay them that 50% part-time employee, you can't pay them 50% of the 47 1,476. So let's talk about employers' practical next steps for this implementation. To address the new salary level, um, we think that all employers should identify and review which of your exempt positions and salaries fall between that former 23,660 annual salary level threshold and the new $47,476 salary threshold. That is that population that the Department of Labor estimates to be approximately 4.2 million workers. Next, determine which of that population or positions don't meet the salary test and can't remain exempt. Um, and we recommend looking at the duties testing as well. Um, we'll talk about that, that we really think employers should use this as an opportunity to get to the point of full compliance. The Department of Labor 
has been exceedingly active in recent years. And we think not only will they use this as a time to audit employers on the basis of the salary level threshold, but also on the duties test, despite the fact they did not propose any changes to the duties test. Then it's really a decision if you want to keep the positions as salaried non-exempt or convert to hourly non-exempt. Both are, would be subject to overtime. And really, the Department of Labor in these final rules made it very clear that just because a position is non-exempt does not mean it has to be paid hourly. You can keep the positions as salaried and just pay the employees overtime for any hours over 40 if employers want to do that. We think because this is an area that has received a lot of attention, not only by the Department of Labor in terms of audits, but also by the plaintiff's bar, we are recommending that all employers work very closely with experienced legal and HR advisors, whether your in-house HR departments or the external HR and legal advisors that you utilize. This is not an area to just make broad changes without really looking at your risk and exposure in working at the messaging. Then um, also, as you are making these changes, it's a time to really develop a new compensation plan, looking both at base pay and that non-discretionary bonus pay that we talked about that can count for at least 10% of the standard salary level threshold for regular employees. You have a different consideration, as we discussed, for your highly compensated employees. We also are recommending that employers budget in for the long term um, those annual auto updates for that minimum salary level. Um, as we had indicated, we think that's going to result in about a 7.7% increase over the three years by the time um, this is next updated in 2020. And really, it's an important time for you as an employer as the population within your employee base is expanding, um, those that are eligible for overtime, to really develop a strategy for overtime. Just because a position is eligible for overtime doesn't mean that you as an employer have to permit those employees to work overtime. You can say that um, you can institute a requirement that employees have to obtain prior management approval before working those overtime hours. And also, as I mentioned before, this is really a time for you to um, really communicate with your employees your strategy, your philosophy, your rationale here, and really massage that um, so that employees aren't um, offended or misinterpret the changes that you're making. We'll um, discuss this in more detail on future slides. And really take this as a time to train and educate your managers on managing over time. So again, to that requirement of obtaining prior management approval, really gaining an understanding of what the financial impact is of that overtime pay on your um, financial statements. And also, um, as they are developing new positions, really working with them on those job descriptions and job duties and responsibilities to determine what the classification is of new positions. We are encouraging employers to especially um, review closely these borderline positions where not only the pay but also the duties are on the line. The pay certainly is going to be on the line with that standard salary level threshold. And also the duties, even traditionally, um, have sort of cut both ways. Um, could be exempt, could be non-exempt. It's really important to look at the duties and responsibilities. So I encourage you to look at assistant managers, non-CPA accounting positions, 
lower level sales positions or sales support positions, help desk positions, computer positions that don't include programming in the duties and responsibilities, many customer service positions, nursing and in-home care service positions, and of note, I don't have details on this, but I encourage any of you who um, are um, providers of Medicaid-funded Medicaid services for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities in residential homes and facilities with 15 or fewer beds, there are some, um, there's a limited non-enforcement period of some of the provisions for those industries, so I encourage you to Google that and look on the DOL for those um, non-enforcement policies. And also, as I mentioned before, those part-time exempt positions, they still have to attain that um, base standard salary level of 47476 Also look at your highly compensated employees those employees who previously you were considering as um, meeting that highly comped exemption who were earning between 100,000 and this new enhanced threshold of $134,044. So how do you calculate your overtime exposure? First of all, um, you could look at converting the employee's current salary to hourly pay. So you would take that weekly salary, divide it by 40 hours per week. That's their current hourly rate of pay. Then you can estimate the number of hours that employee or employees within that position worked um, over 40 hours per week. And then you multiply that, those hours per week, times one and a half times their hourly rate of pay. That is your overtime exposure. So let's talk about different options you have for making um, changes that are compliant with this new standard salary level threshold. So let's take an employee whose current salary is $40,000. That is above the old 23,660, but below the new 47,476. So let's, in this example, you are keeping them at their salary and allowing overtime. So you would keep that employee at the $40,000 salary per year divided on a weekly basis. And then you would, to figure out their overtime pay, you take that 40, thousand converted to an hourly rate, which is 1923 per hour. And if you estimate the employees working 10 overtime hours a week, you would pay that 40,000 salary on a, on a weekly basis. And then overtime pay at their, at one and a half times their hourly rate times 10 hours, 10 overtime hours, which is, uh, equate to the annual pay of $54,997.80. So that um, for this employee would result in an increased cost to you as the employer of $14,997.80 per year. That cost increase would be greater if the employee worked more than 10 hours of overtime per week. Option 1A then is to convert the employee to an hourly rate. So for all their time, you are paying them on the hourly rate of 1923 per hour. And then again, you are paying them over time at one and a half times that hourly rate for 10 hours. So your cost increase is the same, that 14,997. And again, the increase would be greater if you had more overtime. But option one, I think, allows you to, if you feel as though the employee would be offended by converting to hourly pay, um, you can keep that, um, you can lessen that impact by keeping them salary or do option 1A and convert them to hourly just to make it totally straightforward. Let's move on now to option two. So with that, you would calculate their 
current hourly rate and prohibit overtime. So again, you take that 40,000, convert it to hourly rate, which is that 19.23 per hour. But as we discussed, just because a position is eligible for overtime doesn't mean you need to permit that employee to work overtime. So in this case, you would tell the employee they can't work overtime. If they do work overtime, you can use that um, as a basis to discipline the employee for that. So in this instance, you're not allowing the employee to work overtime, so you are simply paying them the 40 hours per week at 1923. The risks associated with this, though, is if, there, if this employee or position regularly was working more than 40 hours a week, you will need to hire additional staff to do those additional, what would now be considered overtime hours per week. This also may have an adverse impact on staff morale. It could also have an impact on your clients in terms of the people with whom they are having contact every week will change for those additional overtime hours. It will be a different person performing those duties. Um, it may also have an adverse impact on work product, work productivity, or perhaps even workplace injuries. If you are just hiring somebody to work those additional 10 hours per week, they may not be as familiar with the equipment, with the duties, the responsibilities, so you may have some additional injuries or lower productivity. Now let's look at option three here. That is to calculate a new hourly rate and allow limited overtime. So with this, you would estimate not you would estimate their weekly overtime hours and use that in the calculation of the hourly rate. So with this, you divide the current weekly salary by 40 regular hours plus their estimated weekly overtime hours times 1.5. This gets you down to an adjusted or new hourly rate of 1398 per hour. So to calculate the, the salary for this, or the pay for this, um, the employee's effective hourly rate drops from 1923 per hour to 1398. That's what they're paid for their normal 40 hours. And then for their 10 overtime hours, you would pay them at one and a half times the 1398. And because you had built in the 10 overtime hours, your actual pay that you would pay the employee is only $40,000 per year for working 50 hours per week. There is no net increase in cost to you as the employer here, provided the amount of overtime does not increase. The risks you do run here is that the employee um, figures out that their um, adjusted hourly rate is lower and that they are actually working more time for less on an hourly basis. Let's move to option four, please. With option four, you would raise that salary level of the employee to meet the new level. So with this, the 40,000 current annual salary, you would increase to meet the 47,476 per year, which results in a cost increase of 7,476 per year. With this, you are not having, the employee does not need to track their time. You aren't paying overtime because you are keeping them at the standard salary level threshold. So what do we recommend you as employers do and when? We recommend that you start preparing for the December 1 effective date for, um, that is the timing of the pay increases. And then also start working into your budgeting for 2020, those auto updates. So you might want to start slowly increasing people's pay so that you don't have to do a big leap in 2020. We also recommend that you consult with knowledgeable HR and employment law experts to really help with that messaging. Um, do the math for those uh, options 1, 1A, 2, 3, and 4 there, and develop a plan to communicate the changes to employees. 
So let's talk about um, some of the things you should consider. So really, it's a time to assess your risks and exposure. There are going to be questions of wage disparity based on gender, age, race, national origin, and other protected classes. And keep in mind both state and federal and local. Um, and then also converting to hourly pay brings with it increased wage and hour compliance considerations. Not only differing pay rates for nights, weekends, working on holidays, um, paid breaks, um, enforced break times, meal times, uh, timekeeping requirements, um, overtime pay requirements. We've talked about that in other wage and hour compliance issues. Um, I think, as I had mentioned before, uh, we all need to be very mindful of the fact the Department of Labor is really um, active right now. There was an article in Madison last week that the Department of Labor had audited 24 um, businesses in the hospitality industry in Madison and audited them for a combined $724,000. And this was front page news in Madison. Uh, this was very, very bad publicity for all of these employers. Um, and there were some very nuanced and unique issues that the Department of Labor um, audited these and find these employers on. So for example, the Food Fight Restaurant Group, um, some of their issues were for compensatory time and gap time. So that's travel between two restaurants that this employer had, plus pay rate discrepancies if employees are doing the same job at two different locations. And this article in the Department of Labor and all of the press releases noted that these audits included not only back pay, but also liquidated damages, which is two times back pay. And this resulted in tremendous bad press and even boycotts for um, some of these employers and social media just blew up with it. So what are some of the outside risks? I think you can't underestimate the external impact on not only your clients, your customers, your patients, your donors, if you're nonprofits, key constituents, things like that. If you restrict overtime pay, you may need to hire more workers, and that brings with it unfamiliar faces and contacts for your clients and customers. and may really adversely impact um, the customer loyalty and also potentially loss of business. And as I mentioned with that DOL audit, bad press and social media posts from the conversion of salary to hourly pay and a change from exempt to non-exempt status, plus people's perceptions that they might have been owed residual back over time pay. So really, I think your biggest risk is unhappy employees. Um, don't underestimate the importance of messaging these changes to employees. Employees who have for years been salaried view that really as an accomplishment in moving up the corporate ladder. Converting them to hourly pay may be viewed as degrading. They may feel as though they've also lost the opportunity for past overtime wages, whether justified or not. Um, and will that drop in pay or the conversion from salary to hourly result in more employee turnover? Poor morale, a drop in employee engagement and loyalty, decreased productivity, more workplace injuries, and certainly, as some of these um, employers saw in Madison last week, negative social media posts. So the messaging and rollout must be very carefully managed to minimize her pride, perception of lost back overtime wages per morale, and really, if morale drops, employees are disengaged, unhappy with you as an employer, you do run the risk of potential union organizing. So 
enough about the gloom and doom. What are some of the opportunities here? I think it, all of us as employers should use this big media coverage over the next couple of weeks. Um, you really can use this to your advantage. You can review the salary levels and classification of all employees. Include with that review under the duties test, even though there haven't been changes to that, and fold all of those changes in with your salary level changes. And use this as a time to really dramatically boost your wage and hour compliance in an era of distinct and marked DOL activism. So with that, I'm done and we can open it. I know we only have about five minutes left, so I apologize if that if um, anybody has questions we and um, we don't have time to reach everybody, feel free to either reach out to Tricom or directly to me. My contact information is here on this last slide. I'm happy to answer any questions people may have at this time. Okay, so we do have some questions that have come in. Um, a lot of people have asked about questions uh, in related to the slides show uh, presentation slides. If anyone is interested in that, um, go ahead and you can either email myself or you can put in a chat or a Q&A message and I'll get that sent over to you uh, after the presentation today. Um, so a question that's come in, is the threshold the same for employees in New York City as in other cities, the 455 a week? It's, it's actually um, $913 per week, um, which is the 47,476 divided by 52. So that was indexed based on the lowest um, census area. So that salary level threshold will apply nationwide, regardless if you are in New York City, LA, or the poorest city in the country. Okay, and what's 455, is that what it is currently before the increase? That's, that's what it is currently, yeah. Okay, okay, so. All right. Um, we will also have a recording available. There's another question about that. I will. Um, we're going to be posting it on our website uh, after the presentation, so you'll be able to uh, access it there, and I'll give you the information for that. Um, so yeah, I've read an article yesterday that states that some bonus and commission can be counted toward meeting the minimum pay threshold. Is that your understanding? Yes, and in fact, I had a couple slides on that. Up to 10% um, of the standard salary level threshold can be attributable to non-discretionary bonuses, commissions, but those bonuses have to be paid at least quarterly. They can be paid more frequently than that, and you can include um, catch-up provisions but for highly compensated employees, um, that 10% cannot count for that base 47,476, but the differential between the new 134,000 and the 47,000 can be satisfied. Nearly two thirds can be satisfied by non-discretionary bonuses. Okay. Um, so just an example here, if I have an employee with a base salary of 40000 annually and they make 50000 annually per year in commission paid out monthly, I can only include $4,747.60 of the commission amount. So are they eligible for overtime pay? Is in that example, I'm sorry, what did you say the employee's base pay? Was it forty or fifty thousand? Base pay was forty thousand. Their base pay only and it looks like they make their, fifty thousand annually with commission. So seven thousand four seventy six of their so only ten percent 
only the 4,746 of their pay can be attributable to overtime. So in this case, the person, you would take that 40 plus 4,476, they don't meet the standards. So in that case, you would have to increase their base pay. In order for them to be exempt from overtime. Correct. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, for those in the staffing industry, how does the new law affect independent contractors paid as W-2? Well, if you're paying them as W-2, they aren't an independent contractor. W-2 wages are solely for employees. So if you are paying an independent contractor W-2 wages, they're an employee. How many hours? To, a, a true, I'm sorry, a true independent contractor is paid 1099 wages through okay. AP. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, how many hours outside of an employer's office must a salesperson work to be considered an outside salesperson? It's a great question. Oh, um, I don't have that offhand. If you want to email me outside of this, I can look that up for you. But there are, if you go on the Department of Labor website, there are fact sheets and there is a whole fact sheet on outside sales exemption. And that'll have all that information for you. Good resource for that, okay. I don't, uh, well, hang on, I do have another one. Back to the um, W-2 contractor question. What if a project only lasts three months? Uh, do they need to make the base pay prorated? If you're paying somebody, if they're a limited term employee and does their, I would say, their pay would need to be at least, so say that's three months, 47,476 divided by 12 times three is what you need to be paying the person to be considered exempt. Okay, very good. And if, again, if anyone has any other questions that we uh, were unable to address for you today, feel free to reach out to either Jane um, or myself directly. Um, I put my contact information up as well. And with that, we'll wrap things up today because I know um, we've gone just a little bit over. I'd like to thank all of our participants in today's webinar and Jane for sharing your knowledge of the DOL's overtime final rule and the impact on the staffing industry. The recording of the webinar will be available on our website at tricom.com under the Resources tab in the Industry Insider Webinars section. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.